Good morning and praise the Lord. Uh, welcome to church this morning. Uh, we are very glad you could join us. May I request everyone to please stand for our opening hymn, O Worship the King. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this day, for this time, Lord, we, as we come together in your name to worship you this Sunday morning. We are grateful for your presence, of presence among us. Uh, fill this place with your Holy Spirit this morning throughout the worship. We ask for your forgiveness and mercy for all the sins that we have committed. Help us not to repeat the mistakes and walk in your ways. We thank you for your blessings that you've showered upon us and for goodness and faithful in our lives. Uh, Help us to know and carry out your will for us in every, and in every decision we make. We pray for peace in the world. We pray for peace in the nation. Pray for world leaders to be blessed and guided by you. Pray for wisdom. Um, pray for wisdom to help them make right decisions. Pray for persecuted Christians to be delivered, Lord. We thank you for a successful medical mission in Kenya and helping people to see your love and compassion. Thank you for the protection that you gave everyone who were involved. We lift Sunij into your hands as he brings your message. Bless and guide him, and you speak through, uh, speak to us through him. We pray for your blessings to unite us and power us to, and support love, support uh, love one another as we seek to serve you and spread your ma message of love and hope. Amen. Welcome to the church this uh, Sunday morning. Uh, we are very glad you were able to come and join us. Uh, we welcome you to join our praise team as they lead us into worship. Good morning, our dear family of believers. We're gathered here today and it's such a happy day that we get this opportunity to come into God's presence, to be happy, to have breath in our lungs. Uh, the first song we're going to start with is called Every Praise. And every time I think about this song, I can only think about one thing. It says, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And we know that nature obeys the authority of God. So every time I'm driving by, I just look at the trees and I just imagine them praising God. So if nature is praising, if the trees and rocks are praising, if angels are praising, who are we to hold it back, right? So let's use this time to give everything that we have to praise God and thank Him in one accord, this song says. There's so much power and unity when we praise Him. Uh, so let's take this time to praise our dear Lord, for He deserves all glory. Every 
Paul wrote a letter to Corinthians when they were in so much confusion saying that for all the promise of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us it was written in 2nd Corinthians uh, chapter 1 verse 20 how encouraging all the God promises are yes and amen praise God all the promises are sure and firm while we are worshiping uh, our God with this song, let's all believe that they are unchanging, unwavering, unmovable. We can have confidence in His faithfulness and rest in His promises. God is faithful. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He always with us and He will never fail us. He is our help in time of need and He will never let us down. Let us remember the faithfulness of God and trust in His promises. So, dear family in Christ, let us rest in his faithfulness and proclaim yes and amen to all of his promises. Let's sing. Father of kindness, you have borne our place. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, oh my help, this time of need. Lord, I can help but sing. Yeah. 
song is more like Jesus. First John chapter 4 verse 9 says that in this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that he may love us through him. This tells us that our God is such a loving God that he sent his one and only son into the world to die for our sins. Like it says in the song, you willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. Jesus did that because he loves us. This song shows us that more of him means less of us and that we must decrease as he must increase. We should always put him first before us. Our God is such a great and perfect God and he is all we need. So let us pray that we can be more like Jesus as we sing this next song. Take every day, cause all of you. 
The next song we are singing is Give Thanks. The song draws inspiration from 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which encourages us to give thanks in all circumstances. This hymn emphasizes gratitude and the importance of recognizing God's blessings despite life's challenges. As we sing, let us remember the joy and peace that come from a, great, from a thankful heart. Because he's given to 
goodness of God. The amount of goodness in God is, is infinite. He is faithful to us even though we lack. He is our father friend who has laid his son life to redeem us. What I consider as goodness of God in my life is said in St. John chapter 6 verses 44 where Jesus said, No man can come to me except the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. If father hasn't drawn me, I can't be following Jesus. This is the greatest goodness I received, just like all of you here, while millions out there yet to receive the true goodness. So church, let's lay our life down, surrender to him, as his goodness is running after us. Let's sing this wonderful song. Running up, it's running up to me. Your goodness is running up, it's running up to me. Your goodness is running up, it's running up to me. Your goodness is running up, it's running up to me. Your goodness is running up, it's running up to me. Your goodness is running up, it's running up to me. Your goodness is running up,
Lord, with all the breath that we have, Father Lord, we sing your praises. We give you thanks. We give you glory and honor for Lord, it belongs to you. You are the one Lord who left everything in the heavenly realms and sought after us, Lord, sought after us sinners who are so prone to wander and so prone to going away from your grace. Yet, O oh Lord, in your love, you reach out and you seek us, Lord. And Father, you have given us, Lord, this privilege to be here in this place today, to be gathered here in your name, and Lord, to sing your praises. For Lord, we know that you are here according to your word, Lord, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so Lord, we welcome you in our place, O Lord. We worship you, we adore you. Please accept these praises, O Lord. And Lord, we pray that Lord, you would be pleased, O Lord, with our sacrifice of praise today, Father Lord. Father, we submit the rest of the service into your hands. We pray, Lord, that you we commit this time in your care and pray, Lord, that you would please talk to each and every one of us, Lord, through your word. Uh, pray that you would be with the word as it is preached today and please be with our kids, Lord, as they recite the Bible verses. Oh, Lord, let your name be glorified and magnified in our midst. Please be with the rest of uh, the service and um, each and every one of us, oh, Lord, in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Old Testament reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 16. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword, his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women who sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it, had, and it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall, but David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Then Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. 
therefore when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely he was afraid of him but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them here ends the reading The New Testament reading is taken from Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 26. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 26. Now the words of the flesh and evident, which are adultery, partness, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, Contenance, jealousies, outburst with wrath, F selfish ambitions, dissensions, heritages, envy, murders, drunkenness, rival rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh, which is passion and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us all work in the spirit. Let us not become considered provoking one another, envying and another one another. Please be seated. Uh, we welcome Sunit uh, to give us the word of God. Good morning. There was a biologist. She was uh, having an experiment with two monkeys. And both the monkeys were placed in glass, uh, what do you call it, glass cages. And they were placed right beside each other. The first monkey, both were given some task to do, some minor task. They both finished the task. And as a reward, the researcher gave a cucumber to the first monkey. And the first monkey was absolutely thrilled. It took a bite. And meanwhile, the researcher gave a grape to the second monkey. And when the first monkey saw it, he threw the cucumber back at the researcher because the monkey was upset that the second monkey got something better. So is our behavior any different? As Christians, are we different from even non-believers or as churchgoers, do we respond differently? So this brings us to today's topic, dealing with others' success. How do we deal with other people's success? How about success within the Christian, within the church, within your circle? How do you deal with comparison and jealousy among uh, believers? We are all human and we are, I think we are prone to it, right? We feel it's almost like my, like my right to be jealous and to compare and to be angry, right? How do we respond to co-workers, neighbors, Roommates, friends, siblings, uh, brothers-in-law, sisters-in-law, who in the eyes of the world are smarter, funnier, skinnier, prettier, godlier, and wiser. Who in your circle is crushing life? They have the perfect marriage, they have the perfect house, they go on the perfect vacation and they're raising the perfect kids. How do you deal with their success? So that brings us to 1 Samuel chapter 18 verses 1 
16. This is right after David has this enormous victory of killing Goliath. We'll be looking at two people one, how, and how they respond to David's success. So the first one is Saul. He responds with comparison and then with rejection. And Jonathan responds with celebration. So that's the three ways to respond to others' success. One is comparison, rejection, and celebration. So as I speak to you, I know that I've done plenty of responding the wrong way. So I'm also still learning to celebrate the goodness in others' lives. So what is comparison? The first one, comparison. What is comparison? It's really ranking God's will in your life against others and trying to figure out who got the better deal from God. Comparison is like the clay telling the potter what needs to happen. And generally when comparison starts, contentment leaves. Why do we compare? And there are numerous answers for it but my impression is we compare because we question our own value we look around at people and see if we are as valuable as them we want to be counted as successful and if we take a step back who determines the value is there a standard if i buy say a bigger car than your car does it mean that I got a bigger value? And what if someone else buys a bigger car, right? So it's like a, a moving target, okay? So we'll come to that uh, shortly, okay? But let's get back to comparison. There are two things from comparison. One, comparison feeds on the er and the as factor. What is the er factor? We want to be smarter, skinnier, funnier, prettier, godlier, wealthier than those around us. And look at verse uh, uh, 7. Saul has slain his thousands. So I'm sure that was music to the ears of King Saul. But what did he uh, sing afterwards? And David his ten thousands. What would have caused a king to compare himself with a, a mere shepherd. Saul did not want to be great, he wanted to be greater. And some of you do have the err factor around those around you. But some of you may not desire to have the err factor over others. You might, want, you might have the ass factor. You look around and decide for yourself who in your world is perfect and you wish if I could be as smart, as godly, as wealthy, as funny as this person, then I would measure up. I would truly be valuable and counted as successful. Now there's a problem with both the err factor and as factor. So what's the problem with the err factor? While you will have the err factor over some people always, some people will always have the err factor over you. If you haven't found them, just wait a little longer. Problem with the as factor, you might be looking up to someone who seemed to have it all. This per a person is perfect in your eyes, but that perfect person might be looking at someone else as having the er or the as factor. These people we think are perfect, they too are wanting and looking at others and wishing they had what others have. Perception is not reality. So the second one about comparison. Comparison has dreadful side effects. You know these drug commercials where you have people playing with their dogs, singing a, a song, it, the, the sky is blue and they are barbecuing with their friends and everything looks perfect. And then there's a soft, soothing voice saying, this can cause nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, demon possession or even death. The point is that you can take the medicine but it may not work 
with you. Comparison is not a medicine, it's a poison with dreadful side effects. So what are the side effects? One, verse eight, Saul was very angry, so anger. Number two, verse nine, Saul eyed David from that day forward this reminds me of the phrase, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So it's like you're always on guard. It's like a weight on your shoulder. Third is fearful. Verse number 12. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but the Lord had departed from, Dave, from Saul. Saul might have thought that he deserves a praise, right? After all, he's the one who told David to go and fight Goliath. He's the one who gave the permission. And perhaps killing, killing Goliath was perhaps luck. Comparison starts a fire that either scars us or destroys us. You begin with comparison, it goes into gossip, and then it goes into slander, and then you feel justified you feel vindicated and then you even feel, oh yeah, even God is on my side. But, and you kill this person hundreds, hundred, of, hundred times in your mind. And the danger with a comparison is unchecked comparison can lead to jealousy and unchecked jealousy leads to hatred. You might start with comparison but unknowingly you are moved on to jealousy and from jealousy to hatred. It's so subtle. And let's assume there is a person that you are, you started with comparison, now it's gone into jealousy. And let's say the person comes to your church. As soon as the person comes in, you, you see the person, right? You notice that person. Uh, you notice the demeanor. You notice their attire. You notice the interaction with others. You are critical about what they say and what they do. Inwardly, it disturbs you. And you tell yourself, I love this church. If only that one person stops coming to my church. Or could be this person is in your circle of friends and you say, oh, I wish this one person would stop coming to these wonderful gatherings. Jealousy is, the jealous are troublesome to others and a torment to themselves. We are just killing our own soul. Jealousy will poison your own soul. It's like the grenade that could, uh, that could burst any time, that could explode any time. Jealousy slows down your Christian growth. Jealousy is your forerunner of chaos. And jealousy brings you into bondage. So the question is, Am I stricken with jealousy? Are you stricken with jealousy? I believe we are more prone to comparison than the history of mankind. Reason, social media. Social media has given us the ability to look over the fence and compare with anyone in the world. When I was a child, I was a small fish in a small pond perhaps maximum comparing with five people in the, in the building and perhaps another five people among my relatives. Now you are a small fish in the Pacific Ocean. You can compare with anyone. You can uh, monitor what your celebrity eats for breakfast. You can see this wonderful couple that uh, were perfect are now having abuse in the marriage and they are going to court and it's being on television. In, now some stats for you. In the year 2006 to 2016, 10 years, suicide rates among kids between 10 to 17 rose by 70%. Teenagers diagnosed with clinical depression rose by 40%. What happened between 2006 and 2017? iPhone happened in 2007. Of course, social media was there before iPhone. But now, social media is now available in your pocket, screaming for attention. Every time you look at the iPhone or, or the smartphone, it is lying to you. It's delivering the same message it delivered to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Did God really say, 
you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. Now it says, did God really say that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? If you spend as little as 30 minutes on social media per day, okay, I know that's really less, it significantly increases your chances for anxiety and isolation. Average American checks his phone every four minutes. We live in the most medicated and therapeutic generation, yet you think that we should be the healthiest, but we are the most anxious and depressed generation ever. 93% of people on social media are likely to compare with others. There are only 7% of people in social media who use it the right way. We drive our sense of self through comparing with others. Excessive uh, use has resulted in many issues including sleep problems and attention deficit disorders. And two more things I would like to say. In Jan, Mark Zuckerberg, in a Senate hearing, apologized to the parents of children who died of causes they say were related to social media. Just two weeks ago, the US Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy suggested putting a warning label on all social media platforms. So that is comparison. Second, rejection is saying no to God's plan in your life and in others' lives. So we'll see three stages that Saul, or three steps that Saul takes. First, verse eight. Then Saul was very angry and saying, displeased him and he said, they have ascribed to David 10,000s and to me have ascribed only thousands. Now, now comes the important part. Now what more can he have but the kingdom, okay? Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Saul was told earlier to this that you're going to be replaced by a better king. And now he begins to realize perhaps David is the one who is going to replace him. So first Saul realizes David is most likely the one to replace him. Second, Saul tries to kill David, verses 10 through 11. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. We often don't realize this pent-up jealousy and hatred. We are not fighting man. We are really fighting God. If we daydream jealousy and nourish it, we open ourselves to sinful influences in our lives. We think we are just cracking open the door to take a peek, but we are taking the door off its hinges. Now look at the distressing spirit. It's not from the devil, it's from God. What is Saul trying here by throwing the, by, uh, throwing the uh, spear? He's trying to kill David. Saul is trying to reject God's plan for his life and reject God, God's plan in Saul's life. And when hurling the spear did not work, what does Saul do? That's stage number three. Saul plots against David. That is verses 13 through 16. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he had behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. You will wonder, what is Saul trying to do here? Why is he trying to promote David, whom he just tried to kill? Saul is plotting against David and hoping David would fail 
and die in battle. Saul's plan is to stay on the throne till he dies and afterwards Jonathan his son takes over. But what is God's plan? Replace Saul and let David be the next king. So we see a clash there. And sadly, Saul spent the rest of his life trying to stand up against God by trying to plot against David, loses the respect of his own family and kills and takes his own life. Saul lit a match that burnt his life to the ground. So how does this impact us? Do we reject? How does it look in our lives today? One way rejection shows up in our life is through resentment. And here are a few questions for you and me. Do you have a 2020 vision of God's goodness in other, others' lives? and fail to appreciate what God has given you? Do you hate colleagues when they get promoted? Are you jealous of your fellow believers for their nicer homes, cars, or jobs? All their kids seem to be flourishing while yours are not. You resent them and resent God for not giving what he has given them. This resentment is rejection. It's saying, I reject God for what he's doing in their lives. I reject God for what he's doing in my life because you, gave, you, God, gave me a bad deal. At work, how does it look? Are we a micromanager? Do we need credit for everything we do? Do we reject people just because they show more promise and more talent than us and we feel threatened? This is rejecting God in our lives and in their lives. So Jesus should be our example. God's will for Jesus was that he would lay down his life for humanity. God's will for us was that we, through the path of salvation, would be saved. Jesus could have rejected God's plan. He could have saved, spared his own life, thereby denying God's will in Jesus' life and God's will in us. Instead, Jesus went to the cross, fulfilling God's will for Jesus and God's will for humanity. We are to model that and live that surrendered life. So we saw celebration, sorry, we saw comparison, we saw rejection. Now, on to the last one, celebration. Celebration is a resounding yes to God's will in our lives and the lives of others. We don't see this in King Saul, but in his oldest son, Jonathan. John, Jonathan was a rightful heir to the throne. If anyone should have rejected David, it should have been Jonathan. If anyone should have complained against God, it should have been Jonathan. Right? But let's read verse 3 and 4. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan and David were like-minded men in faith and in combat. His armor and clothing represented royalty. Jonathan was taking his right to the throne and handing it over to David. By doing so, Jonathan is saying to God, I accept God's will in David's life and I accept God's will in my life. There are two things we can learn from Jonathan. God, one, God has called us to be faithful and not famous. In Matthew 25, we read about the parable of the talents. Here we see a man going on a journey, he calls his servants. And to one he gave five talents, to the other two, and to one, and to the other just one talent. And once the master is back, to the servants who doubled his talents, the master said, you have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Similarly, God has given all of us talents and skills to steward. And each one of us will stand one day before God to give an account for what the talents he has given us. 
So we have no time to compare or reject. We have only time to celebrate what God has given to us and what God has given to others. And pray for others as they steward it and pray for ourselves as we steward what God has given us. All of us have the potential to be faithful in God's eyes. And the second one, others don't have to lose for you to win. You don't need everyone to fail for you to succeed. Jonathan is a poster child for friendship. The, every sermon preached in the church includes Jonathan. He still lived. I know that some of his dreams might have not come true because he, after all he was raised by his parents to be the heir. But that did not work out. But he still won. So going back to the earlier question, what is the solution? The antidote to overcome jealousy is to understand the profound love of God shown on the cross. The cross of Jesus declares value upon you and me. One, it says God loves you. God loves me. And second, it says that Jesus counts me precious. He gives me value. He has freely given value by his love and mercy. Once we understand how valuable we are in God's sight, we don't need to chase the world to get value. God the Father has given us value through His Son, Jesus Christ. So what is a practical step we can do? Are we struggling with comparison or rejection? This life is no longer about us. It's about letting God reign in us. This life is not about making us famous, but making God famous. I don't have to be famous. I am called only to be faithful. To do what God has called us to do and to cheer others to what God has called them to do. So we can wake up every morning reminding ourselves the value God has placed upon us. Understand the profound love of God upon us and to say yes to God's plans. We can say thank you Lord for this life that you have given me to steward. I don't want to live anyone else's life. I want to live the life you have given me with the highs and lows. Help me to steward it faithfully and encourage others as they steward theirs. I also want to take a, a two minute uh, detour. In all this, where do we see Christ? Just like Saul responded to David and how Jonathan responded to David, how do we respond to Jesus? One, we can respond like Saul responded. He walked the broad way to destruction. He clung onto the throne that was no longer his. We can cling to our own thrones instead of surrendering to the king of kings. We can protect our own self-interest and respond to Jesus with suspicion and rebellion. Or the second choice, we can respond like how Jonathan responded. He walked the narrow way to life. He stripped himself of the throne when he realized it was not his and celebrated the rightful king. We can rightfully steward the talents God has given us. And we can, we can strip ourselves of the right to rule and let God reign in our lives. So in conclusion, who am I? Am I a Saul or a Jonathan? When I started reading this, I thought, okay, I cannot see myself as Saul, but the more you study, I see more of myself like Saul. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, O oh Lord. Free us from the bondage of comparison and rejection. Help us to celebrate others' success. Keep us away from comparing and competing with each other. Rather, let us spur one another and encourage one another. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for the time this Sunday morning, for the opportunity to spend time together in worship, Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you for filling us with your presence, empowering us to be your hands and feet in the world, to help us to carry out your light in our daily life and to serve others uh, with love and compassion. For uh, we pray that you, you be the center of all our families and relationships, Lord. Lord, uh, we left uh, Ms. Sheila Rajendra into your hands uh, for complete healing for her, Lord. Uh, we left Pastor Uncle and Auntie and everyone who are traveling back home. Be with them and grant them journey mercies. We also thank you for uh, a successful Kenya mission trip where we were able to touch 20,000 souls, Lord. We thank you for the love and compassion that you have, you have shown them, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to be able to do that, Lord. Lord, we ask for protection and guidance for the week ahead and lead us on the path of righteousness, Lord, and keep us safe uh, from harm and temptation. No matter the challenges we, we may face, Lord, uh, let your peace and protection be with us and keep us until we meet again. Amen. Thank you.